In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Our help is in the name of the Lord. Who made heaven and earth. If you, O Lord, kept a record of sins, O Lord, who could stand? But with you there is forgiveness, therefore you are here. Since we are gathered to hear God's word, call upon him in prayer and praise and receive the body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ in the fellowship of this altar, let us first consider our unworthiness and confess before God and one another that we have sinned in thought, word, and deed, and that we cannot free ourselves from our sinful condition. Together as his people, let us take refuge in the infinite mercy of God, our Heavenly Father, seeking his grace for the sake of Christ and saying, God be merciful to me, a sinner. Almighty God, have mercy upon us, forgive us our sins, and lead us to everlasting life. Amen. Almighty God, in his mercy, has given his Son to die for you, and for his sake forgives you all your sins. As a call and ordained servant of Christ, and by his authority, I therefore forgive you all your sins, in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Have regard for the covenant, O Lord. Let not the downtrodden turn back in shame. Arise, O God, defend your cause. Do not forget the clamor of your foes. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Let us pray. Almighty and everlasting God, give us an increase of faith, hope, and charity, and that we may obtain what you have promised, make us to love what you have commanded. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God now and forever. The Old Testament reading for the 13th Sunday after Trinity 
as written in the second book of Chronicles, the 28th chapter. The men of Israel took captive 200,000 of their relatives, women, sons, and daughters. They also took much spoil from them and brought the spoil to Samaria. But a prophet of the Lord was there, whose name was Oded. And he went out to meet the army that came to Samaria and said to them, Behold, because the Lord, the God of your fathers, was angry with Judah, he gave them into your hand. But you have killed them in a rage that has reached up to heaven. And now you intend to subjugate the people of Judah and Jerusalem, male and female, as your slaves. Have you not sins of your own against the Lord your God? Now hear me, and send back the captives from your relatives whom you have taken, for the fierce wrath of the Lord is upon you. Certain chiefs also of the men of Ephraim, Azariah the son of Johanan, Barakiah the son of Meshillamoth, Jehazkiah the son of Shalom, and Amasa the son of Hadlai, stood up against those who were coming from the war and said to them, You shall not bring the captives in here, for you propose to bring upon us guilt against the Lord in addition to our present sins and guilt. For our guilt is already great, and there is fierce wrath against Israel. So the armed men left the captives and the spoil before the princes and all the assembly. And the men who have been mentioned by name rose and took the captives, and with the spoil they clothed all who were naked among them. They clothed them, gave them sandals, provided them with food and drink, and anointed them. And carrying all the feeble among them on donkeys, they brought them to their kinsfolk at Jericho, the city of palm trees. Then they returned to Samaria. This is the word of the Lord. The epistle is written in St. Paul's letter to the Galatians, the third chapter. To give a human example, brothers, even with a man-made covenant, no one annuls it or adds to it once it has been ratified. Now the promises were made to Abraham and to his offspring. It does not say, and to offsprings, referring to many, but referring to one, and to your offspring, who is Christ. This is what I mean. The law which came 430 years afterward does not annul a covenant previously ratified by God so to make the promise void. For if the inheritance comes by the law, it no longer comes by promise, but God gave it to Abraham by a promise. Why then the law? It was added because of transgressions, until the offspring should come to whom the promise has been, had been made, and it was put in place through angels by an intermediary. Now an intermediary implies more than one, but God is one. Is the law then contrary to the promise of God? Certainly not. For if a law had been given that could give life, then righteousness would indeed be by the law. But the scripture imprisoned everything under sin, so that the promise by faith in Jesus Christ might be given to those who believe. This is the word of the Lord. Alleluia. O Lord God of my salvation, I cry out day and night before you. Alleluia. Gospel according to St. Luke, the 10th chapter. Glory to you, Lord. Turning to the disciples, Jesus said privately, Blessed are the eyes that see what you see, for I tell you that many prophets and kings desired to see what you see and did not see it, and to hear what you hear and did not hear it. 
And behold, the lawyer stood up to put him to the test, saying, Teacher, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? He said to him, What is written in the law? How do you read it? And he answered, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength and with all your mind and your neighbor as yourself. And he said to him, You have answered correctly. Do this and you will live. But he, desiring to justify himself, said to Jesus, And who is my neighbor? Jesus replied, A man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho, and he fell among robbers, who stripped him and beat him and departed, leaving him half dead. Now by chance a priest was going down the road, and when he saw him he passed by on the other side. So likewise a Levite, when he came to the place and saw him, passed by on the other side. But a Samaritan, as he journeyed, came to where he was, And when he saw him, he had compassion. He went to him and bound up his wounds, pouring on oil and wine. Then he set him on his own animal and brought him to an inn and took care of him. And the next day he took out two denarii and gave them to the innkeeper, saying, Take care of him, and whatever more you spend, I'll repay you when I come back. Which of these three do you think proved to be a neighbor to the man who fell among the robbers? He said, the one who showed him mercy, and Jesus said to him, you go and do likewise. This is the gospel of the Lord. I believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and of all things visible and invisible, and in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God. Begotten of his Father before all worlds, God of God, light of light, very God of very God, begotten not made, being of one substance with the Father, by whom all things were made, who for us men and for our salvation came down from heaven, and was incarnate by the Holy Spirit of the Virgin Mary, and was made man, and was crucified also for us under Pontius Pilate. He suffered and was buried, and the third day he rose again, according to the scriptures, and ascended into heaven, and sits at the right hand of the Father, and he will come again with glory to judge both the living and the dead, whose kingdom will have no end. Now I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord and giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son together is worshipped and glorified who spoke by the prophets. And I believe in one holy Christian apostolic church. I acknowledge one baptism for the remission of sins, and I live for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen.
In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. A lawyer, a master of the scriptures in that day, poses this question to our Lord. Teacher, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? St. Luke's Gospel tells us that he addresses Jesus in order to put him to the test. The lawyer, being a scripture scholar himself, already knows how the Bible answers his question. But he wants to see what this prophet, with no formal education, is, about, is going to say about it. It's time to play hardball, Jesus, and we're not pitching underhand. How does he answer? He very simply refers him to the scriptures, which, of course, the lawyer knows, and gets him to give the answer himself. The scholar combines Deuteronomy 6.5 and Leviticus 19.18, and he's right on target. What shall I do to inherit eternal life? You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength and with all your mind and your neighbor as yourself. But now this well-educated man who knew the answer to his own question perfectly well, now he has to justify himself. What the scripture says in itself is uncontroversial, but how it's to be applied in real-life situations, in the real world, well, this raises the questions and the controversy. For instance, who is meant by my neighbor? The conventional answer for which we can even find scriptural support is that my neighbor is a fellow member of from my own people. A people, after all, is a community. Uh, and a community means togetherness and oneness for which everyone has responsibility for everyone else. Each member is expected to look after every other member as himself. This is part of what it means to be part of the same complete group as a whole. And this gives direction to us, too, for the community in which we live our lives and helping out with the lives of others. Is someone from outside the community my neighbor? In Bible times, a sojourner who lived among the people was considered to be part of the community and therefore also seen as a neighbor. But Samaritans who defiled the temple in Jerusalem were not considered neighbors. Who is meant by my neighbor? Now Christ answers it with a parable of a man who is on his way from Jerusalem to Jericho, who falls among robbers, is stripped of everything, and then left lying half dead on the roadside. This was a perfectly realistic story because such assaults commonly happened on the Jerusalem-Jericho road. It was much traveled. A priest and a Levite, experts in the law, mind you, those who knew about salvation and who in fact are professional servants of it, come along. But they pass by on the, other, uh, on the other side without stopping. Now, there is no need to suppose that these were especially cold-hearted men. Perhaps they were afraid themselves and were hurrying to get to the city as quick as they could to not end up like this guy. They did not want the fate of that man to happen to them also. Or perhaps they didn't know how to go about helping him, especially since he looked like he was quite beyond help anyway. Next, 
a Samaritan comes along. Probably a merchant who traveled often on this road with his goods to buy and to sell. And he sees the man. It seems that the only helper of this half-dead man could be a Samaritan. Someone, in other words, who doesn't belong to Israel's community and has no obligation whatsoever to see to this abandoned victim to see him as his neighbor. That being said, what does this Samaritan actually do? He doesn't ask what his obligations are or how far his obligations extend beyond the community. He doesn't ask about the merits required to inherit eternal life. Something more central happens. Something more core to his being happens. And this is what guides his actions. His heart is wrenched open. The word compassion is generally how we get this in our English translations, but it's also more than that. The word used is derived from the Greek word splankna. It was descriptive of the innards of an animal being splatted out on the ground before being used in some kind of religious ritual. This came to define the feeling of compassion that originates right down within somebody's guts and their innermost self. The Hebrew word for this type of compassion, rahamim, from the word raham, has a slightly nuanced meaning. It presents the image of a mother's womb, of a mother's care. It's a compassion that goes down so deep in order to protect life. The Samaritan saw this man in his half-dead state, and it strikes him viscerally, touching his very soul as a mother with child in womb. He had compassion, and that's how we translate it today, calm passion. Calm means with, as in community, with unity. Passion is a strong love or a desire for. It's also the picture of our Lord's passion, his death on the cross for us. The Samaritan felt with passion for this beaten man. He is struck to the soul to have mercy on this man. He himself becomes a neighbor despite any questions and despite any danger. In fact, the question changes. No longer is it, is this man my neighbor or not? But now, you have become your neighbor in need. Your neighbor now counts as you, as yourself. So the new question is, how do you love your neighbor as you love yourself? Before this parable of the Good Samaritan, the lawyer may have just as well asked, is a Samaritan my neighbor too? The answer at the time would have seemed to be no. But our Lord completely turns this answer on its head. He turns it upside down. The Samaritan, the foreigner, makes himself to be the neighbor and shows us that we have to be a neighbor too, deep down, to show that we already have a neighbor for us, one to care for. We have become like a mother whose little life inside we must protect and whose heart is wrenched open to be shaken up by the needs of another. Then we find our neighbor or better, we find ourselves in our neighbor. This agape love, as it's called, cuts straight through the principle of if you give, I'll give, or I'll love you because you love me. Aren't we surrounded by people 
who have been robbed and battered, we already are becoming a neighbor to those who are in need of our help. For God calls us to have an eye. God calls us to have a heart. The heart of the Samaritan. And to have courage to love our neighbor. The priest and the Levite may have passed by more out of fear than out of indifference. But the risk of goodness to others is something that we learn from Christ. We ourselves become good from Him. We ourselves learn to be neighbors from Him. From Him, we have an eye for service, to do what is asked of us, to do what is possible for us, to even do what is expected of us. The man who lies half dead and is stripped on the roadside is the image of Adam, is the image of every man in general. For we have truly fell among robbers. We have been alienated, battered, misused throughout our entire lives. Everyone in this world, and even throughout history, has lived under some sort of oppression that we know to a greater or a lesser extent. And if this half-dead man lying on the roadside is an image of us all, then the Samaritan can be none other than Christ Jesus. God himself, who for us is foreign and distant, has set out to take care of us, his wounded people. God, though so remote and so far away from us, so Samaritan to us, has made himself to be our neighbor. His oil and his wine poured out upon us are the holy sacraments, our anointing as his sons and daughters in holy baptism, our reception of him and his body and blood in the sacrament of the altar. He brings us to the inn. He brings us to the church. And he arranges for our care and pays the entire deposit for our cost and for our stay. God makes himself our neighbor so that we can become neighbors. Everyone is alienated, especially from love. Yet we find we are healed and we are filled with God's gift of forgiveness. Here we find love. And from this, we are called to be Samaritans, to follow Christ and to become like him. When we seek that, that's when we live rightly. We love rightly when we seek to become like him who first loved us, first of all. Amen. Peace of God which passes on our standing. Keep your hearts and minds through faith in Christ Jesus. Amen. In our prayers this day, we remember those who are listed in our bulletin. Our prayers continue for Ron Shack and Paul Shootback, as well as Laverne Ludy, Liz Kimball, Linda Reinhardt, Bradley Hagler, Warren Stulak, Craig and Karen Kalnan, Blake Fowler, Rebecca Belt, Susan Kim and Elwood Trotter, as well as Joyce White, Bob Stewart, Mary Orvis, Greg Goodson, Janelle Hopkins, and Hal Sinclair. This week, we remember and give thanks uh, for the Rachel Buckholz family with Noah and Emmeline, who uh, was granted guardianship uh, this past week. Also, we pray for Jan Fowler and Mike Kelly. Both are having surgery this week. Jean Kraft, who is in recovery. For David Richardson, under hosp hospice care. We also pray for the families of Eileen Sprouls and Gerald Whitmire. Eileen and Gerald passed away this past week. Eileen's uh, memorial service will be at the Memorial Gardens this week. It's going to be a private burial at the Memorial Gardens. 
We also pray for the family of Walter Small. Walter is the father of Kelly Heinen of our parish family. We pray for that family. Walter uh, passed away this past week as well. At the conclusion of each of our petitions, I will say the words, let us pray to the Lord, the congregation, please speak the words, Lord have mercy. Let us pray for the whole people of God in Christ Jesus and for all people according to their needs. Dear Heavenly Father, we pray this day for the church throughout the world and especially for this congregation that we would not bypass those in need, but rather be filled with God's grace and love to care for our neighbors. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For the Lord of the harvest to send forth workers into the vineyard and that through their service, the world would know the compassion and care of Jesus Christ, the Good Samaritan. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For all pastors, especially Matthew, our Senate President, Robert Lee, our District President, Greg, our Circuit Visitor, that they would be faithful in their preaching of the gospel and in their administration of the oil and wine of the sacraments. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord, Lord have, have mercy. mercy. For those who are enemies of God and his people, that by the working of the word and the spirit, their hearts would be softened and they would be given the gifts of repentance and faith. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For a good harvest, production from drought and famine, for deliverance from illness and fear, and abundant provisions for all, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For all governments and those in authority, that they would justly and wisely use their positions and power to promote the general welfare of us all. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For the sick and suffering, especially Ron, Paul, Laverne, Liz, Linda, Bradley, Warren, Craig and Karen, Blake, Rebecca, Susan and Elwood, Joyce, Bob, Mary, Greg, Janelle, Hal. We also pray for Jan and Mike, for Jean, for David, the family of Eileen, the family of Gerald, the family of Walter, that God would provide care and rest for all of them. We also pray a petition of thanksgiving for Rachel and her family as they now have a guardianship that they desired. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For those who receive the Lord's Supper this day, that by faith they would receive the eternal benefits of Christ's true body and blood, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. It is into your hands, O Lord, that we commend all for whom we pray, trusting in your mercy through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. Maybe see.
The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks unto the Lord our God. It is truly good, right, and salutary that we should at all times and in all places give thanks to you, O Lord, Holy Father, Almighty and Everlasting God, for the countless blessings that you so freely bestow on us and all creation. Above all, we give thanks for your boundless love shown to us when you sent your only begotten Son, Jesus Christ, into our flesh and laid on him our sin, giving him into death that we might not die eternally. Because he is now risen from the dead and lives and reigns to all eternity, all who believe in him will overcome sin and death and will rise again to new life. Therefore, with angels and archangels, and with all the company of heaven, we laud and magnify your glorious name, evermore praising you and saying, Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of Sabaoth adored, heaven and earth with full acclaim, shout the glory of your name. Sing Hosanna in the highest, sing Hosanna to the Lord. Truly blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed are you, O Lord our God, King of all creation, for you have had mercy on us and given your only begotten Son that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. In your righteous judgment, you condemn the sin of Adam and Eve, who ate the forbidden fruit and justly barred them and all their children from the tree of life. Yet in your great mercy, you promise salvation by a second Adam, your son, Jesus Christ our Lord, and made his cross a life-giving tree for all who trust in him. We give you thanks for the redemption that you have prepared for us through Jesus Christ, Grant us the Holy Spirit that we may faithfully eat and drink of the fruits of his cross and receive the blessings of forgiveness, life, and salvation that come to us in his body and blood. Hear us as we pray in his name and that he has taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Our Lord Jesus Christ, in the night when he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and he gave it to his disciples and said, Take and eat. This is my body, which is given for you. This do in remembrance of me. In the same way also, he took the cup after supper, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink of it, all of you. This cup is the New Testament in my blood, which is shed for you for the forgiveness of sins. This do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. The peace of the Lord be with you always.
Let us pray. We give thanks to you, Almighty God, that you have refreshed us through this salutary gift. And we implore you that of your mercy you would strengthen us through the same in faith towards you and in fervent love toward one another. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Let us bless the Lord. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you his peace. Amen. Amen.